I'm Linda Hirsch. I'm Jim Carney, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. Since the era of No Child Left Behind, and now Race to the Top and the Common Core Curriculum, students are taking more and more tests. These tests can affect their promotion, admission to middle and high school, and even graduation. They may also be used to justify school closings and evaluate teachers. A growing number of parents and educators are becoming so uncomfortable with this reliance on high-stakes testing that they are refusing to let their children participate. They are calling for parents and children to opt out. Today, a highly regarded school principal, along with a parent advocate, joined me to discuss what's wrong with these tests and why more children should not take them. Later on in the program, I'll visit folks directly involved with the question of whether to take or not take the test. But we begin with Linda and her guests in the studio. My guests today are Anna Allenbrook, principal of the Brooklyn New School, a public elementary school in Carroll Gardens, and Janine Sopp, a parent and member of Change the Stakes. Thank you both for joining us today on EdCast. Today we're talking about opting out of high stakes testing. So I want to begin by asking, what is high-stakes testing and how often are our kids being asked to participate in high-stakes testing? High-stakes testing are something that are administered by the state for all children in grade three to grade eight. They happen in the spring um, and they are in ELA and in math. They so are, ELA is the language arts? That's okay. correct, yes. And they are um, anywhere between 70 and 90 minutes long per day for three days in the spring and that's six days altogether. And what makes them high stakes, it, what used to make them high stakes, was that the test would be counted for decisions such as promotion. Um, with our new administration, that has actually changed, and they will no longer be used for promotion decisions, but they are now used, um, the progress that the students make on the test is used to determine um, a teacher's effectiveness. So they're evaluating teachers. Are they still evaluating schools as well? Yes, they are evaluating schools, but um, I believe with the new administration, we will no longer be getting the letter grades that we've gotten in so the let's past. So talk both of your perspectives. You're a principal and you're a parent. Mm. How did you as a parent come to the idea that you did not want your child participating in the tests? Well, in second grade, I noticed that my daughter was coming home very anxious. Uh, she was speaking about taking a test, and I really didn't understand what she meant by that. Um, and at the time, she was enrolled in a very traditional school. And when I asked her teacher about what test she was talking about, she was talking about the test that the third graders were taking. And so I questioned why she was being told in second grade about a test in third grade. When I began to understand the nature of the test, I made a decision that she would not participate in that, in that form of testing. So in terms of the nature of the test and in terms of your perspective as an administrator and a parent, what is it about the tests that you think make them worthy of opting out? Well, actually, that's, that's a really good question because I, I, Janine um, started in my school as a parent um, when her daughter entered third grade and she came to me and said that she wanted to opt her daughter out of the test and I really didn't think that was a great idea. Mm -hmm. So my perspective so on testing on. has changed. Okay, so what made and you change? The change was related to the test that was administered in 2013. And I saw that test and I <coughs> thought it was an inappropriate test. It was um, called a common core test, but what I saw more was a test that was meant to deliver deliberately confused children and that was especially true with the English language arts test so there were many questions that had more than one answer that could be perceived correct so once I saw it was a test that wasn't really going to give us information that would help us educate the kids I really did not see why we were um, subjecting children to it and it did feel like we were subjecting children to it we saw children in tears children very very upset and that was a change from the test that we used to administer 
Why do you think this test made kids so so much more upset or so fraught with anxiety? Um, it was too long. It's too it long. went on too long. And for some of them, not all of them, well, no, I would say for all of them it was confusing, and for many of them it was too hard. So for all of the those reasons. And the, when I say too hard, that's a very difficult mm -hmm. thing. I don't mean too hard in terms of at a more rigorous level, but I mean too hard in terms of not re asking questions that children could not make meaning of, so therefore not really testing their reading ability. Isn't that the sign of a bad test? I mean, as a yeah. person who's been involved in <laughs> test preparation, to me, an ambiguous question or a question that has more than one answer is a bad question. It felt that way to me. From your perspective, what, did you, what are some of the reasons that you think the test should not be taken? For me as a parent, I wouldn't necessarily say a better version of the test is actually a good thing. Um, I question the validity of using one test to grade the, the quality of the teacher Mm -hmm. um, and the quality of what my daughter knows with a whole year of experience. Um, at, at the Brooklyn New School in particular, the curriculum is rich with hands-on learning and interaction and collaboration. And all of that, to me, is more meaningful than what one day or three days of testing are going to tell me as a parent as to what she's learned throughout the whole entire year. It, it to me, could be used as a benchmark, but nothing more. It should never hold that much meaning. Can I play just a devil's advocate position for a moment, though? If I tell a child to not take the test, am I in some sense giving a message that I'm presuming they will not do well on the test? Am I giving a presumption of failure to a child by saying, don't take the test? I mean, could there be a negative connotation? I think, I think absolutely, um, and I think that's a concern that we have, that they are, um, as we discuss this, this concept of opting out with families, um, there's a lot of confusion about the why. Okay. And I think the big, the background piece to this is the way education has changed um, in the last 10 years, where you go into many schools and test prep is the be all and end all of the curriculum. And that's not what we want to see children learning in third, fourth, and fifth grade. So, um, but I do agree with you. I think there have been children who literally said to us, my parents think this test will be too hard for me. And that is a concern. Uh, in some cases, that's a legitimate concern for the parent. Um, another issue that we have with testing is children who are second language learners taking the test in English, and the test is do unfair. Right. Uh, children who with learning disabilities, and the test is unfair. So sometimes it is too hard because it's not the appropriate mm -hmm. test for those particular learners. But for many of the children, it's a bigger issue than their performance on the exam. Do you think that schools, and I don't mean your school, but that schools are teaching to the test? Because I hear that a lot when guests come on the program. <laughs> you see that happening. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, even, in, even in the school where we're, we're not teaching to the test, the homework assignments are skewed toward a standardized kind of either fill out a bubble or choose, uh, you know, choose from four of these answers. Um, but I, I speak to parents in all schools, you know, as, as a parent advocate, as a, an education advocate around this issue of testing, I talk with parents from schools where test prep starts in September and doesn't end until after the tests, and that is the curriculum. They're, they're not teaching science, they're not teaching social studies. The arts have gone out the window. The priorities are English language arts and math, and that's really what the kids are coming out with. And they're bored and they're frustrated and it's not what parents want. Jim Carney had the opportunity to speak with a Bronx parent who decided that she would opt her child out of testing. So let's hear what she has to say. Rosa Perez is the parent of a third grader in the New York City school system. Um, why did you decide that you wanted your daughter to opt out of the, the tests in school? I started to kind of get an understanding uh, regarding testing um, early September, uh, October. And my, I have an eight-year-old daughter. She's in third grade. Mm -hmm. And this is the time when they start to do testing. Um, I was pretty concerned about it. Um, I didn't had, I had lots of questions about it. I uh, didn't really have anyone to go to regarding these questions, but it just so happened that I was talking to my sister who lives in Brooklyn and she has three daughters of her own and I, while I was talking to her I said you know 
I'm going through these issues and wondering how my daughter's going to do in these tests, you know, and she says, well, I'm not so concerned. And I said, really? I said, then she says, no, I'm not. My school, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and opt her out. And my school is willing to support me in that. Um, have you had a chance to speak to your daughter's teachers about opting out? I did. I did mention it to my daughter's teacher and see if she had any information regarding opting out. And unfortunately, she said she didn't have any information. She did not know about the first um, steps to opting out. The English language learners, um, they're just learning the language. They don't really have a full grasp of our culture. They don't have a full grasp on, on, on language for them to go ahead and take a test where I feel that my eight-year-old, and she is a English speaker, it's, you know, to compare it, it's very, it's not fair. It's not fair to them at all. And I think that parents of children with, of different languages should really consider opting out for their children. And how did your daughter feel about being, you know, the student who, who doesn't have to take the test? Did she feel special? Well, she's very unaware about it. Um, now she's, she understands that, you know, we were standing up for something. She didn't really understand why. Uh, she did, she does feel different. I said to my daughter, I said, you know, you shouldn't feel bad about take, about being considered a score. I want you to know that you're more than a score. You know, I want you to know that you're developing right on target. There is nothing wrong with you. And I don't want you to think or feel that as you grow old, that a score is going to determine who you will be or who you're going to be. Now back to Linda and her guests in the studio. She obviously expresses some of the concerns that the two of you have mentioned. And she also says that she wasn't aware initially that she could opt her child out. So let's talk about that <laughs> process of opting out. Can anybody do it or how do you do it if you wanted to do it? Well, I think until a couple of years ago, it wasn't really a, an idea that anyone had about a, approaching tests by opting out. And then along came parents like Janine and they said, I want to opt my child out of the test. Um, the state had to grapple with that. Suddenly there were lots of, um, lots of those kind of requests. So it's now actually, we are told by the state that you can't opt out, that you must, the child must refuse. Mm. So there's been a little bit of double talk Child. about <laughs> about this because of course an eight year old um, there are the eight there are the children who refuse because for whatever reason but in general an eight year old is not really refusing the test um, and it's the state has struggled with this um, but at the end of the day when we receive a letter from a family saying I do not want you to administer this test to the child then we have to um, follow the parents' request if we don't use these tests which are intended to assess student progress and student learning in some way, however flawed. If we don't use them, what should we be using in its stead? <laughs> uh, teacher assessments. Okay, and right. what would that look like in the classroom in terms of knowing if I want to know that my child is making progress in reading or progress in math, what should that what should that look like? Well, in reading, for example, teachers do something called a running record with their children on a regular basis. So that's one form of assessment. They have conferences where they'll sit and discuss the book in a, either in a small group or with an individual. That's another uh, form of assessment. The children are often required to write a response um, to to a, um, a P, something that they've read. And also, they are actually given tests in school. There'll be questions, um, teacher-made tests, sometimes other kinds of tests that assess how well they're reading. The same thing in math. So there's always a, a good program should involve assessment on a daily basis. It shouldn't be something that we wait once mm -hmm. a year to get some data on. Do you feel as a parent that you know how your child is doing in school? Without? Absolutely. How yeah. do you know that? I mean, these, these tests aren't giving me any information that's useful. First of all, I don't get to see the questions on the test, which is should be a concern for a parent. Um, we get the score at the end of it, but we don't know really what that means. Um, when does the teacher get the test score? <laughs> the following year after her children have left her. So then yeah. there's no way of using the results of the test to improve the pedagogy for the child in your classroom at the time? No. Is that going to be changed? Um, no, because it takes a long time to mark these mm. tests. 
It's very time consuming. <laughs> so when those results come in, they cannot be used to improve what you're doing in this no. particular class. Okay. Mm -mm. No, and uh, you know, I have the kind of relationship with, with my daughter's teacher where if she's struggling with something, I'll learn about that through the teacher and I know that there's a reason she's coming to me to discuss any concerns. If I have any concern about homework or, or how I feel she's doing, I can speak with the teacher. I, I have that trust, I have that level of relationship. I think every parent wants that relationship with the teacher. We, we send our kids to school eight hours a day that's the relationship that is being built. Um, the other thing I would just want to mention is that these tests where, where, where we're working with children in schools and teaching them collaboration and that they can speak to the teacher when they have a question, during the testing time there's none of that taking place. So you've removed the child from something that's very normal and natural for them and put them in an environment where they're very contained and and I just wonder how that's affecting the child who <clears throat> once had a relationship with a teacher that they can converse with very easily, and suddenly the teacher is is sort During of that separation period. Mm -hmm. Jim Hakori got some more perspectives on this issue, so let's take a look. The Wolf Thompson family live in Washington Heights in Upper Manhattan. The two boys, Caleb and Travis, attend the local public school. Uh, my two boys go to PSIS 187 in northern Manhattan. Um, it's the neighborhood school. It's practically right across the street. Um, and it's a, a wonderful I say, anchor to our community here. It's, uh, many people in the neighborhood have children who go there. We know many people in the neighborhood through the school. So it's a very important um, part of our life, our our community life um, beyond just the education for our kids. When my younger son started school, he was getting test prep in kindergarten. They were having, they had test prep questions, fill, learning to fill in the bubble, learning how to game the test, starting in kindergarten. He had his first test in third grade, and it was sort of a non-event. The following year, when he was in fourth grade, he came back, and he's never had any test anxiety. He's never, he's, he always does well on, the, on, the, on all tests, regardless of what he says, he does well on the tests. Um, but he came back saying that the school had brought in a yoga instructor to help the kids with their anxiety about the tests, and he thought it was crazy. I asked Calum, the fifth grader, how he feels about standardized tests. I think they sort of get in the way. I don't really, I don't really do so well on tests. How come? Why do you think so? I'm not really sure. It's just that I'm better at doing work at home because I have more time to do it. We had considered opting out, opting him out, or asking him if he wanted to opt out in fourth grade, except that he was interested in applying to this competitive middle school that required the, the, the score. So he did take it in fourth grade, but it was sort of a fiasco with a bunch of anxious teachers who just stopped all of the curriculum right in the middle of the school year to do test prep every day. His classes were very heavy early on in the year with tests, a lot of tests, a lot of quizzes, heavy on homework, um, and then it went into full bore test prep mode about the month before the tests in April, and then afterwards it seemed like the, the pressure, this was released like, a, like a, a pin popping a balloon. I was speaking to his literacy teacher and asking him, you know, what, what are you doing in class, and he was talking about all these great novels that they were reading, and the intense discussions that the kids were having about the novels and I said well what are you going to be doing for the rest of the year and he said oh we're not reading anything anymore now we're switching to test prep and he said this sort of with this dead face <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said well actually my son may be opting out and his his eyes just lit up. I do wonder about children who um, are coming from families that maybe aren't as learning oriented uh, as ours is, um, for reasons beyond their control, socioeconomic factors, linguistic factors, the number of kids 
in my children's school comes from, come from homes where English is a second language. And I really got to wonder about the stress level in those homes. Um, just having kids in public schools, there's so much to stay on top of. Um, there's a lot involved, and if you don't have the resources um, and the facility to access all that stuff and to stay on top of it, I just have to imagine it's, it just adds a lot more stress that's undue. And now back to Linda and her guests in the studio. You, I'm going to quote something that you had said, and I think maybe it relates to the interviews we've been listening to as well. In one of the, your weekly letters that you sent to families, you do this on a regular basis, you said there is a disconnect what I know and understand about child development and learning and what has been happening in all our schools due to the accountability movement known as Race to the Top. What's the disconnect that you see as a principal? I think for children, especially young children, and remember I'm an elementary school principal, mm -hmm. um, children need to be known and they need to be known in all of their strengths and their weaknesses and it, they are really, we're assessing them at a point that's way too early and so that's the disconnect. That we want to know that a child can talk about um, whatever it is they're studying, can ask a question, can paint a picture related to that, can write a, a little paragraph on it. But testing them in the way that we're doing, that's something that's much more appropriate for older for older children, and that's the disconnect. We're not getting to know them by um, getting some numbers on them. It's just not helping them learn. Are there any consequences for the school or for the children in not taking the test? Might schools lose funding, or is there any negative consequence? If the school does lose a little bit of funding because um, for the children who get a low score, <laughs> it's kind of ironic, for the children who get a low score on the test, there's some kind of, there's academic intervention money that's given to the school, and the school will not get the funding if there's no test score data. Yeah. Do they remove that money totally or do they still keep it available f for later or they just take that away? It's gone, yeah. So that's something for the school to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. What about for the kids, for the children? Are there any other effects for them that might be negative? Well, now that, now that in New York City, which is the only city that was actually using the test scores for promotion, that has been removed. Um, so that's been a benefit for the kids who are opting out. There are other ways in which, and, and we're actually benefiting from this because it's putting the, the promotions in the hands of the teacher, which it has always been. So maybe your voices have been heard somewhat. Maybe this has mm -hmm. been the effect. You have visited schools in Sweden and in Italy. To, what did you see there and what lessons do you bring home for what you would like education yeah. to look like here in New York? I want to stress that what I saw mostly, I did see some upper grade schools, but mostly I saw early childhood. Hey, early childhood. And so what I saw was um, uh, cultures taking care of their really young ones. And one of the things that I learned is if we were to value that early childhood, and I mean um, age one to four, more than we do here in the United States, I think all of the concerns and problems we have would, would go away. What is yeah. taking care of children look like <laughs> they, they are actually going to school um, for, from infancy on they are um, they have excellent medical care excellent health care terrific curriculum in early childhood that's play based mm -hmm. um, not not numbers and letters based and all of that makes for a readiness for school that they have when they enter school at six or seven it's very different it's very di and what would you like to see in the classroom for your children well, what I've, what I've actually experienced at the Brooklyn New School has been a, a very um, age-appropriate, hands-on, art-based learning, which um, allows every kind of learner to succeed. Kids who learn visually, kids who learn auditorily. Um, I think that the idea of, of bringing projects in that experience is what children hold on to. The memory of that, the understanding of that. If you come to the school and you, and you see the amazing museums that the children build, and it's really driven by their own creativity, the, the creative aspect of learning, when that's handled properly and valued, the information stays with the kids. Is the Common Core curriculum going to be 
more of the same? Is it feeding into testing mania? Is it going to take us away from testing? What's your perspective on that? <laughs> I don't know if we have the same perspective. Okay, on that. so let's hear both um, of your perspectives. But I, I think the common core, um, the argument about the common core has been a distraction. For me, the mm -hmm. issue is the testing. I, everything I've read in the common core, I haven't really had that much difficulty with. Mm -hmm. I like to, I think the issue in how, is in how you interpret it. And I think what uh, Janine was just talking about, project based learning, is a a wonderful way to interpret the Common Core. So right now, if we're interpreting the Common Core as being more tests, then it's a problem. But if we're interpreting it as being learning around, about the world um, through literacy, that I think is a great mm -hmm. thing. And what, what was your take on it? Yeah, I mean, my, my concern, and, and I, I've not read the standard, so I, I can't really speak to it the same way Anna can, but my, uh, my biggest concern would be in ages, you know, pre-K to, to second grade, that, that those standards are actually based on developmentally appropriate needs for the children. If we're, if we're asking children to read and write before they're developmentally ready, then to me we're taking away their love of reading because we've already stopped that process from, from unfolding naturally. And because the Common Core automatically means that there are high stakes tests attached to them, then it will always mean more tests. Are you? Were, I know some people on the program have talked about um, a corporate takeover, almost mm -hmm. that the tests are being developed not by educators but by people who are not as knowledgeable. Do you think that's so? Um, you said you took the test, so I, before we leave, I want you to give us your perspective. <laughs> I found the literacy, the ELA questions, uh, especially confusing, uh, especially in grade three. And then the math, but I did find it sometimes got very, very difficult to a point where I would think the non, the children who are struggling are not going to be able to do, do it. We're going to have to wrap up, so one last word from each of you. What would you want parents to take away from this conversation today? You know, New York City and New York State parents have made their voices heard with over 30,000 parents opting out this year alone. Um, the takeaway is that opting out is a strategy, it's not an end game, and that we should really be demanding more of our public schools. Mm -hmm. I guess I will, I'll get back to what you mentioned about corporations. I think that's a huge issue that parents need to be much more aware of okay. than they are. Thank you both for joining us today, Principal Anna Allenbrook and Janine Saab, Change the Stakes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Don't go away, we'll be right back with our Ed Bites. Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. Evidence continues to mount on the damages caused by bullying. The American Journal of Psychology reports that bullying's effects can linger for decades. Some victims showed effects such as depression and anxiety four decades after they were bullied as children. The studies are reminders that we must take bullying seriously and work to prevent it. Inside Higher Ed reports that when it comes to graduate school, the odds are stacked in favor of white men. A survey of more than 6,000 faculty members across a range of disciplines found that when prospective graduate students wrote letters seeking advice and a 10-minute meeting, those letters signed with names suggesting the writers were white males were the most likely to get attention. The greatest victims of discrimination were those with names that suggested they were Asian women. It was noted that professors at public universities showed less bias than their counterparts at private universities. Well, I guess that's just one more place where uh, women are not treated fairly in, in academia. Well, I, I think there are lots of instances. You know, we know that now from looking at all the research. Salaries, promotions, it's, it's some, yeah. something we really have to pay a lot more attention yeah. to, I think. We've got to keep working on that. Yep. Well, that does it for this edition of EdCast. Until next time, class dismissed.